If you have a female body parts, buckle up and brace for impact because we are menopause myth busting. Wherever you are on the premenopause to postmenopause scale, this is going to be a good one. This is episode number seven of the Recovery Room podcast. Nope, you can't blame that on menopause. Eating something to change hormone levels is a myth. The ability or need to balance your hormones is a myth. Using plant-based supplements to change your hormones is a myth. The changes that happen in our bodies as we age over time are natural, but they can be confusing and confounding and difficult to cope with. So misinformation is not helpful. We welcome to the show today gynecologist and menopause specialist, Dr. Marie Forgey. Dr. Forgey will walk us through the many myths around menopause and debunk the misinformation. She'll define menopause, perimenopause, and postmenopause and arm you with evidence. This is vital because your life is important and you can't be powerful without accurate information. Whether you are podcast watching or podcast listening, I appreciate you being here. I'm cancer physical therapist, Dr. Leslie Walke. Please hang around until after the show to learn how you and I can engage directly in my incredible Cancer Survivor Membership Group, Recovery Room Plus. This is the Recovery Room Podcast, discussing all things cancer and cancer recovery. We bring you the experts' accuracy, understanding, and next steps you need to be healthier, more confident, make better decisions, and live your best life after cancer. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Recovery Room Podcast. Today, I am excited to talk to Dr. Marie Forgey, who is a, a gynecologist and an expert in all things menopause, because today we are menopause myth busting. I mean, you got a whole bunch of them, so I am so pumped to talk with you, because uh, boy, there's a lot of crap out there. Seriously, like, right? Yeah. It, it must be like 90% of your time talking with patients about going, okay, that's not true. That's not true. That's not true. <laughs> yeah, we are. That's definitely something that we spend a lot of time in the office. Yeah, about, I bet. I really love it because I think that that's what's the really fun part about medicine is sort of talking through what people know and what they don't know and yeah. then how we can work through it together. Yeah. It's not yeah. always just all about the exam part. It's about right. learning together. Yeah. Knowledge is medicine. Exactly. So the more you know, the better decisions you make, the better decisions you make, the healthier you are, right? That's exactly so, right. All right. So we're talking about menopause today. So can you just, so there's, there's menopause, there's perimenopause, there's postmenopause. Can you kind of describe what menopause is for us to kind of start to get us all on the same page here? Sure. So menopause is a natural stage in a person's life, a person who has a uterus and ovaries. Yep. And it's when there are no more follicles within their ovaries that are capable of ovulating. And okay. so another way to look at it is there's no more eggs in the basket, so to speak. Okay. And when that happens, your estrogen levels drop and you no longer menstruate. The okay. tricky part is that you don't really know that you're in menopause until it's already happened. Right. In the years preceding your final period, there can be a lot of starting and stopping missing months, bleeding twice in a month. And that's what we call premenopause. Mm -hmm. Then when you have your final period and it's been an additional 12 months of no bleeding, you are in menopause, but you okay. don't know when your final period is right. until it actually happens. Yeah. And perimenopause involves both that premenopausal stage and that first year after your final um, menses. And so that sort of encompasses both. So Absolutely. for me, I'm like, I was excited. I'm like, I want this crap over with. <laughs> so yeah. I remember getting to like month 10, 11, 12 after my last period, like, come on, come on. And then when it was that day and that week, I'm like, yes. Yeah. People's reaction to being in menopause is totally different. It's yeah, totally It's different. really amazing, isn't it? Yeah. On an individual level, it's different. It's different culturally. Yeah. Um, so it's really, I, I think it's super interesting. Yeah. Very awesome. Okay, so that that's really helpful. Okay, so let's get to um, our myth busting. Um, so myth number one, menopause is just being part of a woman. No sense in talking about it. Suck it up, sister. Yeah. <laughs> so this is what I hear or actually what I don't hear a lot. Um, yes, menopause is a stage in a person's life. 
but there's also this silence about it in our culture. Yeah. And so yes. then end up people who often go through it feel very lonely. They don't know what's mm -hmm. normal. They don't know what's not normal. And my hope is that the more we talk about it, the more we educate ourselves about it, um, the more we hear other people's experiences, the more we can connect. And then, as you said earlier, that knowledge is power. Then we yeah. have more power to help us make decisions about how we feel about going through menopause and how we treat some of the symptoms that may come with it. And right. so you can't be powerful without having this information or without having accurate information. Yeah, accurate information is the key for sure. So because, I, you know, that the the coming up to menopause, you know, the body cannot, it sometimes doesn't feel normal. It's like it's all over the board. Things are weird, hot flashes, can't sleep, all this weird stuff, you know, bloating and just icky stuff. So it's hard to to feel that and then not to be able to talk about it or understand it or get or have people tell you stupid stuff that's just not accurate is just not helpful. Correct. All right. So myth number two. I love this one. <laughs> Everything that happens to a woman over the age of 50 is related to menopause. <laughs> yeah. This is and not so, true. Right. And so this is the other side of that same coin. So, yeah. well, I don't want people to to think that you know what they're going through is just totally natural and we don't need to talk about it at the same time we don't want to ignore menopause either yeah. we don't want everyone to just blame everything on the change because right. menopause doesn't happen in a vacuum it happens to people who are also aging who also have other medical conditions sure. who also are living in these bodies in these lives so you know there could be more than one factor going on with what you are experiencing yeah. So yeah. a good example is um, that we sometimes talk about is trouble sleeping. Yes. This is for sure a common experience that people who are perimenopause, menopausal kind of experience. And it certainly could be related to those decreasing estrogen levels. But there yeah. could also be other medical sure. conditions that are leading to that. Sleep apnea, um, heart disease, um, acid reflux. So it's important not to just blame everything on that change. Right. Um, and if you notice something, say something. Right. Um, the other thing is that, like we said, it could also be external um, factors. So with that sleep, is it how's your diet been? How's your stress level been? Um, what's your sleep hygiene like? Mm -hmm. Do you have toddlers? Do you have teenagers? Do you have adult children? Yep. Do you have adult parents? Yep. All these kinds right. of people in your lives can, yep. can be causing you stress and affecting your sleep. So that's yeah. just one example of a symptom that many people attribute to menopause certainly could be, but let's not ignore the other things that can happen to a person's body as we get older. Right, right, right. Yeah, for sure. For sure. So it always comes down to really good communication with your, your health practitioner, again, whether it's your physician or your nurse practitioner or whoever you're talking to, but always, always bring stuff up. I'll always say that we you know, people in healthcare cannot help you fix something if they don't know about it. And there's always like, well, I don't want to complain. I'm like, well, you're not complaining. You're sharing your symptoms. That's my job is to sort of help right. is to listen to that. And one of my yeah. favorite things is to talk about it with people. So yeah. you're not being annoying. You're not being a complainer. You're talking to someone who who wants to hear what you're, what's going on. Right, right. Because their job is to help you. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. All right. So myth number three, and I love this one, um, the old hormone balance. You have to, you know, you got to eat this to balance your hormones. Okay. Ugh. So your doctor, you can either balance your hormones or your doctor can help you do a test to see if your hormones are in balance. Bust yeah. that baby out of the water. Goodness. This is a tough one because it's so pervasive in yeah. our society and in our, in our culture to talk about hormones being in balance. Yeah, social media, it's all over social media. Mm -hmm. yep. yep. And the thing about hormones is, first of all, there's a million of them. What hormones are we right. talking about? <laughs> right. um, and what is the balance supposed to be? In Western medicine, there is no such thing as hormones being in balance. Right. Um, your hormones are fluctuating from month to month, from year to year, even from day to day, even from yeah. hour to hour. Right. So there's certain lab tests, certain when you're testing hormone levels, it depends on what time of the day right. um, you have them done and that'll affect the value. And so that's where the labs just aren't really helpful in giving us an information about what's actually going on with you. So, and the other thing is that there can be this large range of what's considered normal. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's not really about the absolute level, but more about changes in levels or more about how you're feeling. So that gets back to the same thing we've been talking about, communication right. about how you're feeling 
is more important or as important as any blood test that we can do for you. Right. Yeah. Because there's no balancing of things. That's like balancing the gas in your car. It's like you can't balance that because the up and down is totally normal. Right. Yes. Okay. Correct. Um, so on the same vein then. Yeah. So let's get to your the myth number four is, is you're actually doctor can test you to see or test your hormones to see if you're in menopause. Tell us about that. Yeah. So the short answer to this is no, there's no accurate right. blood test to really tell if you're in menopause. Now, there's certainly going to be exceptions. And so you may have a conversation with your healthcare clinician about hormone testing. Mm -hmm. Overall, during the menopause transition, and when you are in menopause, your estradiol goes down, and a hormone called your FSH goes up. But you can't use this to diagnose menopause alone. Remember what we talked about, the diagnosis of menopause is having no period consistently for 12 months. Right. And again, those hormone levels can change. So you could miss a couple of cycles. And if we did those lab values on you, you would have a low estrogen and a high FSH. But then the very next month you could bleed. So guess what? Right. Not in menopause, right. despite what the blood, what the blood said. The other thing that can happen is you could be in those final months um, and your ovary all of a sudden could have this surge where you produce a bunch of estrogen, brings you back up to a higher level, which would be considered what we would see in someone in their 30, 20s or 30s, but you're still, it could drop right back down right. and have no effect on your bleeding. So, mm -hmm. you know, most of the time blood testing isn't necessary. And again, it's about talking about what's going on with you and you know, your cycle history and other symptoms that you're going on. Certainly there are going to be exceptions, sure. um, but by and large, hormone testing for diagnosing menopause is not how it's done. Yeah. You know, as I work in oncology, where I see that happening is if somebody is perimenopausal, they go through, um, you know, chemotherapy that might have bump them into menopause or to a point where their ovaries are no longer producing us because that may make a difference in what what medications that a medical oncologist might choose for them. Um, that's I can see a scenario where this might but but in general, you just can't do a blood test and say, Oh, you're menopausal. or -menopausal. Absolutely. And you're yeah. right. And oftentimes those blood tests are done if someone is um, having menopausal symptoms such as lack of bleeding or um, symptoms that we often see vasomotor symptoms at a younger age than we typically would expect. Mm -hmm. um, someone going through natural menopause, maybe because of the medications that they're on. And so you're absolutely right there. We might need some added information to help us figure out what's going on. Yeah. I also think yeah. about, you know, this is a stage in life, just like um, going through puberty. So if you have a 12 year old girl who all of a sudden has a growth spurt and all of a sudden it starts um, developing breasts at an age when we would expect it, we wouldn't do hormone testing to say, hmm, are you going through puberty? No, right, guess what? right. That's you are. Great. That's really good. Yeah, it's like, hello, you are. That's awesome. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. That same girl was going through those symptoms at a much younger age, or maybe didn't go through them and she's much older. Okay, right. then maybe we need to do some investigation. Yeah. So there's also there's natural menopause, which every female is going to go through, or anybody with a with ovaries or are going to go through at some point, right? Um mm -hmm. so, but then there's also in especially in the world of oncology, there's surgical menopause. Um, where those body parts are literally removed. Um, and there's also medical menopause where you can use medications to shut them down. So how are those different from each other? And then how do those, if they are different, how are they different than your, I don't want na natural menopause or however you would sure, sure. call that? Yeah. So natural menopause or when your ovaries, again, sort of just run out of eggs for lack mm -hmm. of a better description, typically occurs around 51, 52. Now, there are some people who definitely have medical conditions, cancers, especially where they have to have their ovaries removed at an earlier age. When that happens, then you have a sudden decrease in your estrogen levels. And so the symptoms, and so you are in immediate menopause. There's yeah. no perimenopause, years <laughs> of the <laughs> level kind of going up and down. You wake up from surgery and you're in it. Yeah, I call that brick wall menopause. Yeah, and that's like, a perfect description. There you go. <laughs> Welcome to menopause. Yeah. Perfect description. And so the symptoms you can experience are pretty similar, except they're a lot more abrupt and they can be a right. lot more noticeable. So yeah. immediate hot flashes, immediate changes yeah. in mood, immediate sweating. Um, yeah. And so that drastic change can be pretty distressing. Yeah. yeah. So I think about it like being on an elevator. If you're on an elevator and you're kind of slowly going down, you might mm -hmm. notice it. You might kind of notice it a little bit. But right. if you were to, suddenly that cord was cut and you were to go down all of a sudden, okay. 
you would yeah, feel you'd it. notice. Okay. So it is more noticeable. Okay. And then okay. same thing with medical menopause. It can be pretty abrupt as well mm-hmm. because we're kind of shutting those, um, you know, the medications, a lot of chemotherapies or other medications that people use are designed to help slow down the rapidly um, producing cancer cells in someone's body. Right. But it also can slow down the um, ovary production or the ovary mm-hmm. cell production, estrogen production. And so you can yep. go into menopause um, from that medication as well. And that could be temporary for as long as you're on the medication, or it can also be long term once you stop it, sort of the damage has already been done and you don't restart. Right. Okay. Yep. So here's a, a lovely subject that um, is, again, really, really hot. <laughs> so uh, menopause is the cause of my weight gain. And if my menop- menopause um, was treated, I would lose all this weight. This yeah. is really tough. Um, many women feel that as they get into their late 40s, early 50s, that they can feel their bodies changing. Mm-hmm. Um and this is, this is, you know, because their strength is different, their size is different, and yeah. those things can be affected by menopause, but it can also be affected just by aging in general. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. if you think about men around the same age, you can see some of those same changes in them, sort yeah. of a rounding of the belly, a decrease in muscle mass, and they haven't had a change in their estrogen status. They didn't right. have much estrogen to begin with. Right. But again, you kind of see those changes as we age. Yeah. There can be an increase in the amount of fat cells or that surround your internal organs, particularly mm-hmm. the ones in your abdomen. Um, we call that visceral fat or visceral adipose. And so you might notice your belly or your abdomen area, you feeling like there's a redistribution in that area specifically. Yes. Yep. And then of course, if you have a decrease in your muscle mass, that decreases your metabolism too. Um, and so you, so for sure, you may see changes, whether it's menopause or age is hard to tease out. But right. the solution we know is not to treat the menopause. Taking hormones or doing something to treat your menopause isn't going to have an effect on your right. weight gain. Yep. Exercises and physical yep. activity is. Regaining that muscle mass can really go a long way. And it doesn't matter when you start. Anytime you start has been found to be beneficial. Yep. Um, and so talking to your doctor, talking to whoever your healthcare clinicians are, um, talking to other people, nutritionists, about what you can do to sort of help with that um, can be really helpful. Yeah, yeah, because again, as we all aged, I don't care who you are, what you are, there is a natural decline in uh, bone mass, muscle mass, um, and that does change everything. So if, you do, if you're not exercising regularly, that can have an impact on, like you said, your basic metabolism, um, you become less active, uh, you sleep different, and then that really, all of that can lead into just that subtle, slow, incipient um, weight gain that happens to, to, to most people if you're not really, really careful. So yeah, and then yeah, that physical activity can help not only with sort of decreasing, you know, the amount of fat cells on your body and increasing your muscle mass, but it also has so many other health benefits that we need to think about, right? Yes. right? Like cardiovascular Absolutely. disease, yep. improving your diabetes, preventing you from getting diabetes. Yep. Um, so, you know, doing what it, what it is that feels right to you. You know, sometimes people talk about, well, what's the right diet? The right diet Mm -hmm. is one that you're going to stick with. It's not a diet. What is, what are sort of those things that you can do every day for the rest of your life to help consume things that are good for your heart and good for your body? Yeah. Yeah. Those, those healthy eating patterns is in getting the word diet out of your, your lexicon for sure. That's really great. Um, And that, you know, and that, and we could talk about visceral fat versus abdominal fat all day long, because there is a difference. And we know that that visceral fat can is the what's dangerous. Mm -hmm. Um, And again, aerobic exercise has been shown to be very effective at at minimizing that. So that's, that's the, that's another good reason to throw exercise on the the happy bucket. All right. So we are on now to myth number seven, we got we're piling these babies up here. Mm -hmm. All right. So there just are not any effective treatments for menopausal symptoms, you're just kind of screwed it is what it is. That is totally false. And because yeah. people often believe this, they don't even bring it up. And so we don't even have the opportunity yeah. to explore, explore all the options. Right. And so, you know, there can be non-medical options. Things like cognitive um, behavioral therapy can be really mm-hmm. helpful in sort of helping make that mind-body connection a little bit stronger that can help with some of your symptoms. 
There can be non-hormonal medications, um, things like low-dose antidepressants or even um, gabapentin mm -hmm. might be helpful. And these are yep. medications that are can be very safe and effective. And then there's also hormonal medications, estrogen and maybe some progesterone, um, depending on what's going on with your body and what kind of parts you have in your body. Um, and again, those can be very effective in improving um, your, your daily living and the symptoms that you're experiencing. Yeah. Exactly. And then so on that same vein, we're, we're, we're on at number eight, which I think is huge, is that menopausal hormone therapies are n just blanketly not safe. Um, you know, we know that that decades ago, um, hormone replacement therapy was much more common than it is today, just kind of blanketly used. And we did know that some, not all, estrogen positive breast cancers are related to that. So there were changes in how they were prescribed and who they were used for. But to blanketly say that these hormone therapies are not safe is not accurate, correct? Correct. That is a huge myth. And yeah. it stems from a lot of it, I think, stems from the Women's Health Initiative, which was this yeah. huge, huge study that was done by the National Institute of Health and Science, which really sort of was done to try to help tease out what are some of the risks of, of menopausal hormone therapy. And they did find risks. They were risks that we already knew about, mm -hmm. um, but I think it really, it was done so publicly, which is good. We want that information, right. but it was also sort of sensationalized and the data wasn't examined yes. uh, in a yeah. super accurate way or, you know, pieces of the, of the data were extrapolated to everybody. Now there right. is no medication. There is no treatment. There is no food. There is no supplement. That's not without risks. For right. sure, there are risks with menopausal hormone therapy. There is increased risk of getting blood clot, increased risk of stroke, a slight increased risk of breast cancer. But I think having conversations with your healthcare team about how high are those risks for right. me as an individual yes. um, compared to what are the benefits is huge. Um, one thing I really like to talk about, people are really, really worried about that breast cancer risk. And so is it there? It can be in certain types of hormone therapy. Mm -hmm. but overall, even the Women's Health Initiative, which really is sort of what, you know, sensationalized and sort right. of really scared people away from some of the treatment therapy. Um, first of all, the people who were in the study were the average age was 63, mm -hmm. um, which so you can't necessarily use all that information on someone who wants to take medication at a younger age when yep. they sort of divided up the um, risks by age. They found that those who started the hormone um, therapy in their 50s or within 10 years of having gone through their last period had far fewer risks compared to those who started it sort of in their 60s. And so I think that's an important piece of data. And then specifically talking about the breast cancer risk, what they found is that there is an increase of about six women per year, per 10,000 women taking the medication who develop yep. breast cancer. Yep. So is there a risk? Yep. And if you're one of those six, you don't really care about <laughs> the other 9,000 of them who didn't get it. Right. But there were 9,000 other people who took hormone therapy and didn't get breast cancer. Right, right. So it's not a guarantee. It's a decision that you want to be thoughtful about using that accurate information. Yeah, yeah. And I think this is a nice time to point out that there's a difference between population health and personal health, yes. right? So yeah. personal health means me, the N of one versus the N of 10,000 people in the study. And um, so again, it comes down to risk benefit ratio for you based on who you are, what your age is, your health history, um, your lifestyle, and a conversation with your with your physician that pushes us on to number nine is if I take hormones, um, I'm going to get cancer for sure. And you kind of already debunked that one. Yeah. So, you know, again, it was that sort of statement from the WHI um, that really put out this blanket statement. It was in the news. Everyone was talking about it, um, that you will have this huge increase in breast cancer. And, it, and then again, what they really found is that that risk of breast cancer was six additional women um, who developed breast cancer each year per 10,000 women who took it for that year. 
Yeah. So not only study results, but the nuance of understanding that. And the, the general person in the public either isn't getting all the information because they're getting it from a news source that's just giving you the pieces, um, nor do they have the research background or medical background to really nuance the information. So again, always talk to your physician about stuff that you hear. So, and here's another big one. I can adjust my diet to solve my menopausal symptoms. Sure. And so we have talked about how changing diet certainly can be good for you or changing. Yeah. And when I say diet, I don't mean restricting food. I mean, right. eating meal plan. what are your yeah. eating habits? Yeah. And so yeah. certainly there are certain foods that we know are to be heart healthy, mm -hmm. foods that are high in vegetable, high in, you know, high, high in vegetables, high in fiber, low in low processed foods, low in sugar. Those definitely can be helpful for your health overall. But and that may help how you cope with some of your menopause. Sure, symptoms. absolutely. Sure. Yep. Yep. It helps you sleep better if it helps you feel better. But plants themselves don't contain any hormones that can help raise your home, hormone levels. Right. Yep. They just don't yep. contain it. Yeah. And yep. plants don't have hormones. And then humans can't take plants and turn them into hormones. Right. Um, so is there a sort of that direct link between eating a eating something and then changing your hormone levels? No, no. there isn't. Not that we're aware of anyway. Okay. So then taking plant-based hormones is safe and effective. Right. And so this kind of comes from that same thought. A lot of this stems from the fact that plants have something called phytoestrogen, and mm -hmm. it's sort of a misnomer. It has the word estrogen in it. So people think that it's estrogen. It's not. It's not hormone. Right. right. Um, the other problem or sort of source of confusion, I would say, is that many of our um, hormonal medications that we prescribe are made in the lab from certain yams or from soybeans. So again, the thought like, oh, well, if it comes from yams, if I just eat yams, that will help. And again, we <laughs> haven't found that to be the case because what that science lab is doing is they're taking the yams, extracting it, and then it's going through this multi-step, super complicated, not natural process, and then putting it in something that then may be helpful to you. And so this is not something that your body can do on its own. Um, right. So eating, consuming more of that certain type of food not, is not necessarily going to be helpful. Yeah. And, you know, the problem is that there are lots of sort of supplemental supplement companies or plant-based hormone companies that sort of use that knowledge gap to help sell their product. Yeah. Um, and that's sort of my worry. Um, and, I, you know, by no means am I going to say what works for you or doesn't work for you. But I just worry that people don't use that same magnifying glass that they use for pharma for sort of prescription pharmaceuticals on a plant based or on a supplement when they really yeah. should be really looking at the evidence. Right. Yeah. And I think that's so very true as people are very scrutinized of pharmacy and the pharmaceutical, you know, pharmaceutical industry, blah, blah, blah. But it's incredibly well regulated. It's incredibly well studied. The data is robust. And but they'll take these things from Costco or Walgreens um, off the shelf that have, you know, the studies on those are actually very poor that, you know, and it says right on there that this has not been evaluated. This has not been tested. They've even done studies on them that there's not even most of them don't even have in them what they say they have in them because they're not regulated. Uh, but people are like they're swallowing those things left and right. So, um, yeah. and again, worst case scenario, they they give you indigestion or they do something icky to you. Um, or they're just giving you really expensive urine. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're, you're not wrong. Not doing anything you're for you. Not wrong. So, right, right. So, so when, so let's, so go back then. So this is uh, our next myth. Then is that supplements are just as helpful or safer than prescription medications that we were just we were just talking about. So that is not accurate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and that's not accurate. And yeah. you know, before we get too much into it, I do want to say, by no means do I think that Western medicine is the only way to go, and any right. all supplements are bad. You know, I I really believe in sort of exploring all options. Yep. But that exploration has to come. It can't just be here's the conclusion. And as you mentioned. For, you know, in America, supplements, they don't have to go through any testing. Mm -hmm. They don't even have to have what they say is on their label in the bottle. And so, you know, they in 2015, just to make the point that you already made, um, the New York State's Attorney General did do a study conducted sort of like a survey 
of supplements that were being sold in all these sort of major pharmaceuticals um, in New York. And they found that 80% of the supplements did not have did not even have the ingredients or the herbs right. that were listed on the label. Yeah. Um, so first you don't even know that what you're getting is what it says is on there, what that picture is on there. Mm -hmm. And then even if you are getting it, there aren't studies that are done on that medication to say whether it's helpful or not. They can just write on there, ovarian health, menopause right. support, and they don't have to define what that means. And yep. they don't have to show any evidence that it does that. And so that just makes me worried that women are being taken advantage of yep. because of those yep. knowledge gaps. And I just yeah. think we deserve better. Yep. And everything, if somebody says it doesn't have any side effects, it's, it's everything does. Water has side effects, right? <laughs> everything yeah. does. Air yeah. has side effects. So there's yeah. just, so just be careful if people are trying to sell you something. Or again, your physicians will be happy to talk to you, uh, you know, about, you know, bring it all in and say, this is this going to be helpful to me? Um, or if we yeah. don't know, can I try it? Or what are the risks of trying it? I mean, most of your physicians are going to be absolutely happy to, to look at that stuff um, with you and, and go through it. And I do have, I definitely have patients and have met people who are like, I swear taking this, whatever has helped me. Okay. It's not for me to say that it's not, I'm not calling right. you a liar. Right. It very may help well help you. And if you're not having any side effects and your liver is still doing okay, great. Yep. I am so, so happy for you. But if you're asking me what has been shown, proven to work, none of them have been proven mm -hmm. to work more than right. placebo. And that right. placebo effect, while it is effective, it's usually not as much as people are hoping for. And it's not long term. Right. Yeah. All right. So okay, so this is a lot of information. Um, so what? so if somebody's like, kind of still confused and just needs a little extra help, in, in, in addition to obviously talking to their physician, do you have like three, what are your three top favorite resources that you would send somebody to? Sure. So my favorite book is the Menopause Manifesto yep. by um, Dr. Jen Gunther. And she's a gynecologist who really explores a lot of the topics that we've talked about today, mm -hmm. a lot of the information that, um, that were that we talked about today comes right from that book. And what I love about it is that it doesn't dumb it down for you. It yeah. realizes that you are a smart human being and that you can understand the science behind it and see all the different sides. So that is something that I recommend. Fabulous. Um, another resource that I really like is electrahealth.com. And they are this sort of one of a kind telemedicine platform where they use evidence-based medicine to really help you understand what's going on and yep. get that menopause expertise. And yep. again, it's designed by people who are in the healthcare um, field. Yep. Yep. So there, I'm familiar with them and they are really awesome. Um, again, very evidence-based and they actually have a, you can go on their site and uh, put your name and they'll email you. I think it's called menopause 101, which is really just a nice PDF that kind of lays out all this stuff. So that that's, that's really nice. Yeah. That's their, they're a good group. Awesome. And then my last resource is your own gynecologist. Yeah. You know, there's somebody who's gone through 12 years of training after high school <laughs> to give you this information. And so I know I always go to my gynecologist, even, yeah. you know, even though I am one, I still go right. to my gynecologist. She's someone who helped train me. She's my mentor. And she just really helps give me a ton of great information to, again, help give me personalized um, healthcare um, recommendations. And yeah. so I would say your own gynecologist is is your is one of your best resources here. Yeah. So anyways, we always wrap up on the recovery room podcast by act asking our healthcare providers because it's self care is so important. So what are you going to do this week or this month for your self care, Dr. Forgy? Yeah, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start swimming. I haven't yeah. been swimming in years. I just went for the first time this morning. It was super hard to get out of bed, to walk yes. through the snow, and to get to the gym and get in the pool. But afterwards, what I'm going to try to remember is how I felt when I got in the car afterwards, when mm -hmm. I was warm and I felt like my lungs could really expand and yes. I felt super accomplished. Um, yeah. So I'm going to try to bottle that feeling um, and help it carry me through for tomorrow and the next yeah. day. Yeah. You know, I, um, um, I have a triathlon training program for, for women cancer survivors and um, it is, it's really hard. I hate being cold. I hate being wet. <laughs> But swimming is really awesome. It's just hard to balance those out. But I will tell you, and you've already probably noticed it, that going to work with your skin smelling like chlorine 
is super cool athlete street cred. So there you go. So don't yeah. don't don't scrape off the, the chlorine because when you go to work, people are like, whoa, she's cool. She's a swimmer. <laughs> so let you might chlorine. be able to see my goggle yeah. mark still there. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. And again, swim goggle lines on your face, the strap marks, that's all athlete street cred. So you go, girl. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. Well, Dr. Forky, thank you so much for, for spending your time on the show today. This has been so helpful and uh, so important. Again, good information leads to better decisions. Better decisions leads to better health. Better health leads to a better life. And that's what this is all about. So thank you again. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. We'll talk soon. Bye. Bye. I love having you in my listener community. So if you haven't already, please subscribe and follow The Recovery Room on both YouTube and Facebook and to The Recovery Room podcast. Please share these wonderful free resources with your support groups, family, friends, and medical teams. I also have an incredible Cancer Survivor Community membership group called The Recovery Room Plus. I'd love for you to consider joining. In Recovery Room Plus, you get direct interaction with me, in-depth cancer recovery info and experts and really cool live events like yoga, book discussions, cooking demos, member meets, and much more. I would love to connect with you. You can learn more at recoveryroomplus.com. The link is in the show notes. Here is your episode seven, nope, you can't blame that on menopause, recap. In this episode, we strived to educate, understand, and normalize the conversation around menopause because accuracy is critical when it comes to your health. Menopause officially begins when you reach 12 months without having a period. We stressed the importance of having a conversation with your physician so you can find out what is best for you, your needs, and your health. Our guest expert gynecologist, Dr. Marie Forgies, three favorite resources include electrahealth.com and their downloadable 21st Century Guide to Menopause. Her go-to book on menopause, The Menopause Manifesto, written by Jen Gunter. And thirdly, a conversation with your individual gynecologist. Thank you for joining me. If you are a cancer survivor, please do check out Recovery Room Plus. Farewell and be well. There are 10,080 minutes in a week, so please use them well. Let's talk again soon.